I'm Cleo. I'm a researcher, theater maker, and teacher. And I'm speaking to you today because TED Talks are my research. I'm interested in the way we, in academia especially, but elsewhere as well, perform knowledge. Every presentation we give, every conference we attend, every paper we write is a performance of knowledge. Only, as academics, we rarely think of it in that way. We think of our content, our research framework, our research design, our contribution to knowledge. We think of knowledge in the same way that we think about this bottle. I can take this bottle on stage or off stage, to the classroom, into the streets, it's still a bottle. So we think that once we've created our knowledge, we can just pour it into any container, a conference paper, a journal article, a TED talk, and the knowledge will stay the same. Only the context of the presentation changes. Well, I think it doesn't quite work like that. And performance theory backs me up on this. Judith Butler claims that social agents, that's all of us, create reality through the performance of language, gestures, and signs. What I'm wearing, for example, is a sign. So that means that performance changes not only how something is presented, it changes the reality of what is being presented. How knowledge is performed changes what knowledge is created. So I'd like to talk to you today about this shift from the how to the what and walk you through some of the ways knowledge changes based on its performance. And since we have our very own TEDx event here today, why not do this in a TED talk? I'd like you to pay attention to the format of the talk. And maybe by the end of it, you'll think about them a bit differently. So let's begin. This is William. William has this great story about a man and a woman who fall in love, but they can't be together because their families hate each other. And William has a lot of good stories. He knows a lot about love and friendship and jealousy and ambition, and he's really good at sharing his ideas with the world. And that leads me to ask, Would Shakespeare have given a TED talk? Now, I think we can safely assume that were William alive today, he'd already been asked repeatedly to share his ideas on the TED stage. Would he have accepted? Obviously, that's a bit of a silly question to ask and nobody can really answer it, but it points me in an interesting direction. I think that Shakespeare and TED have a lot in common. They're both known for reaching an incredibly wide and diverse audience for their time. They platform new ways of thinking. They can challenge and subvert established ideas and identities. And most of all, they're famous for their vast popular appeal. So for all of those reasons, I would venture to guess that Shakespeare would have loved to give a TED Talk. But what they share is really different. Shakespeare dealt in fiction. Ted does not. Ted deals in facts and information and innovation. Only the way they package that is more akin to a good story than to a nuanced weighing of complexities. And I think we need to pay attention to the way Ted performs knowledge because it's already permeated other parts of society. Whether it's a business pitch or an academic lecture, these formats have already been influenced by the way TED does TED. So I'm not saying that TED Talks are fundamentally flawed or that just because they're popular, there's something wrong with them. But I do urge you to consider their performance and ask yourselves whether they're just a simple translation where knowledge is taken out of one container and put into another, or whether this Tedification changes the way we think about knowledge more fundamentally. TED prioritizes experience. 
it asks presenters to share both insight and inspiration. And that changes how I, as a presenter, relate to my audience. It changes how I relate to my content. It automatically alters what I say, what knowledge I share. Consider Amy Cuddy. Amy Cuddy is a really good example of how difficult and potentially career-threatening this simple act of translation can be. She learned, maybe from this book, that to reach a larger audience, you have to simplify your message and make it more entertaining. Because you can't assume that your audience is there based on the interest in your subject alone. So, she gave a TED Talk, quite a famous TED Talk, perhaps you've seen it. In it, she was charming and personal and funny. And she claimed that if we hold certain poses like this, or this, For a couple of minutes before an important meeting, such as an interview, it'll increase our confidence and make the meeting go better. She called them power poses. And she followed the TED style, she made it more accessible, and as a result, she opened herself up to criticism from her own field. Soon after her TED talk, people in her discipline started scrutinizing her research. They accused her of not only giving a simplistic presentation, they started suspecting her of doing simplistic science. So suddenly, how she was performing became about what she was performing. They started replicating her experiments, and when they couldn't replicate her results, they publicly pilloried her for doing tabloid research. Now, I'm not a social psychologist, and the jury is still out on power poses, but what I think her case shows is that she became a target because they mistrusted the way she performed her knowledge. And that exposes a very deep-seated fear in academia, a fear that incidentally goes back to Shakespeare and further. It's the fear of becoming a low-level entertainer. Because we live in a society where being entertaining is being equated with being artificial and somehow morally inferior. Just ask William. He knows. He spent his whole professional life on the south side of the river hanging out with actors and other lowlifes like gamblers and sex workers. And that prejudice stuck. And it's sticking to this day. So, Amy Cuddy's case exposes this mistrust in entertainment and shows us this clash between academia and TED. Knowingly or not, TED inserts itself into a tradition of knowledge, in this case, psychology, and it makes the same truth claims, power poses work. But what it doesn't show us is the same process of validation. So she didn't perform statistical analysis on stage because that wouldn't have been simple, that wouldn't have been accessible. And that created a chasm. So TED changes things quite dramatically, or Shakespeare would say, theatrically. Now, there's one more example, or one more thing that Amy Cuddy is a really good example of. And that's the idea of knowledge as a personal brand. TED asks for a direct connection between the presenters and their content. And that means you cannot promote a talk without promoting a speaker, and you cannot promote a speaker without promoting a talk. Raising exposure for one raises exposure for the other. And Amy Cuddy's talk was successful. In 2017, her talk was the second most watched TED Talk in the world. And to this day, it has been viewed almost 50 million times. And even though she didn't make profit directly from this TED Talk, because TED doesn't pay any of its speakers, it did raise her profile. Her speaking engagements increased, her book sales went up, she markedly entered into a system where knowledge is used as a personal resource. And that's inherent to the TED format. It propels knowledge to be used as a personal brand. And 
this issue of knowledge as a personal brand is not just at stake for the presenters personally who knowingly or not participate in, participate in the commodification of their own knowledge, which may or may not bring them personal advancement. This issue of branding is indicative of the world TED operates in. Even though you can watch TED Talks online for free, the actual TED conferences are not. In fact, they're highly exclusive events. An upcoming TED conference in Vancouver offers reduced price tickets to early career professionals and first-time TED attendees at $5,000 a piece. Everyone else has to pay at least $10,000 to get in. And having the money is not enough. TED chooses conference participants, conference attendees, based on an application process. So this means that these events are not just about sharing knowledge. They're also about making connections and expanding your social and financial networks. And if somebody is willing to pay these sums, hearing a couple of talks won't cut it. They have to offer a different experience. As a speaker, I have to make my talk so compelling and so inspiring that it's worth this price tag. And that, too, changes the nature of these talks. There's so much more emphasis on being entertaining and creating a connection with the audience. In fact, these events offer a certain experience of community. And at TED, this experience of community is the sharing of knowledge. The promise of a TED talk is not, let me tell you about this cool new thing. The promise of a TED talk is, this talk will change your life. Why am I telling you this? This isn't a TED conference. You didn't pay thousands of dollars to be here. I didn't go through a series of auditions to stand in front of you today. And yet, we're somehow all implicated in this. And because TED has become such a global phenomenon, we're also implicated in this way of performing knowledge. And that leaves me as a theater maker, as a researcher, as a teacher, in a difficult position. I like the concept of sharing ideas. I look forward to the ideas being shared here today. I also have nothing against the notion that we need to make academic knowledge more accessible to people who are not in academia. And as a teacher, I love the fact that knowledge can be entertaining and personal and fun. But as a scholar of knowledge dissemination, I contemplate the implications of the discursive apparatus that is TED, and I question the ethical validity of such epistemological performances. Or, as someone who's interested in the way knowledge is shared and brought to the public, TED Talks leave me with a bitter taste. Or as Shakespeare said, things sweet to taste prove indigestion sour. So, if we take into account the system of power that TED holds in place and validates, those exclusive social and financial networks, I wonder what that means for the people watching at home. What does it mean to bring them such an experience of knowledge? Perhaps they share some of the same inspiration, but the TED brand, those TED networks, remain out of reach. A TED Talk seems to say, we're all in this together. But I'm left wondering, are we?